Last section, we talked about China's worldview, and we explained that China indeed has very unique perspectives on the global affairs as well as domestic issues. Today, let's uh, talk about is the world ready for an ever bigger China? In other words, what are the potential disruptions that a likely continuing rise of China may have upon the rest of the world. Let's first look at the picture. These are pictures of Chinese, of course. What are they doing? Can someone tell me what they are doing? What's your guess? What's your guess? Shopping in Paris. Shopping in Paris. And the shopping in which countries? In Hong Kong or which other countries, possibly? The U.S. The U.S., right? The U.S. Indeed, these are pictures of active Chinese tourists going abroad. Every Chinese tourist, when going abroad, spends around 7,000 U.S. dollars. They are not real tourists that you, you understand. They are actually going abroad, shopping. Now, where, why they are doing shopping abroad? Why not in China? What's the reason for them to go abroad and doing shopping? Cheaper. Why the prices in foreign countries, for example, in the U.S. or Europe, are cheaper than they are in China? What are other possible factors explaining the price difference? Any guess? Well, let's, let me ask this question. When you, when you go shopping, when you see a price tag, what is behind the price tag? Of course, part of the money goes to the retailer, right? Part of money goes to the government and distributors. And government taxation is a big factor here. What is your guess about the tax difference between China and the rest of the world? That's especially the U.S. Let's take the U.S. for example. Sales tax. We have students from the U.S., right? What is the average sales tax in the U.S.? 8%, 5%, maybe 0%, depending on which state you are in, right? In China, it's easily, it's easily 30%, easily, including VAT, value-added tax. That's the difference. So I often joke that in China, which makers are usually happy when they take their money from their employers because typically a Chinese wage earner is not paying as much tax as a U.S. counterpart, as his U.S. counterpart. However, when a Chinese wage, wage maker goes, goes to shop, goes on shopping, he is less happy because he has to face a very high tax rate. Whereas the, the opposite is, is the case in the U.S. In the U.S., wage earners are paying a lot of tax. Personal income tax is the largest source of federal income in the U.S. Meanwhile, as long as a person brings money to his bank account, he becomes much happier doing shopping. So U.S. is a paradise of shopping. Well, here comes the difference. Here comes the consequence. That is, Chinese shoppers are going abroad. Well, what is the reaction of foreign countries? What do you guess? Are the foreign countries happy with Chinese shoppers going around? They're happy because the Chinese... The foreign economy. Supporting their economy, right? Supporting the economy. Sure, more specifically, the economy is not, homo, is not a mono, mono, monolithic. There are people in the economy. Who benefit in a foreign country from Chinese shoppers coming in? Who may suffer? Is everybody, are all people happy in a country like the US or Europe? Let's take a relatively small country like, like Swiss, Switzerland. Are all Swiss happy with Chinese shoppers flooding the street in Zurich or Geneva? So the owners of brands, the owners of shops are happy. 
But average consumers may not be happy because there are competitors coming from China. There are more people competing for the same goods that consumers in Switzerland are buying. Well, how about the government in Switzerland? Take Switzerland for example. Well, the government may initially be happy because Chinese tourists and the shoppers generate more tax revenue and more employment possibly. But very soon, they get complaints from consumers. Where are the leading cases? Where are the cases which can may give us some hint of what may happen in the rest of the world? So Hong Kong is an early experiment, a small experiment for of the Chinese tourists going abroad. Hong Kong is a Chinese society mostly, right? Most people in Hong Kong speak Cantonese or some Mandarin, right? Even those people who can speak Mandarin are not patient enough to absorb the flooding of Chinese tourists. Imagine in Paris, imagine in, Swiss, in Switzerland, in Geneva, imagine New York City. A lot of racial, cultural issues can be blending into this kind of aversion towards Chinese shoppers and the tourists. Ideally, a foreign government, say the Swiss government, should do some kind of, what do we call, redistribution. Taxing the shop owners, taxing the brand owners, and then compensate one way or the other the complaining shoppers in Switzerland who are competed away by Chinese shoppers. Unfortunately, very few governments in the world can do this very effectively. So in the end, we can expect frictions in the world when Chinese shoppers are flooding their streets. That's the first one. What's this picture? What can I tell in the, from this picture? Can someone tell me? Which countries most likely these, these pictures are taken from? US, what are Chinese students doing? They are, they are getting their education. And uh, in one picture, one person is very happy, right? Looks like, seems to me this is Harvard Yard. I may be wrong. This person is celebrating his graduation. He is holding a U.S. dollar in one hand and his, his cap in the other hand, celebrating his achievement of education and also anticipating his future of making money. What is behind this picture? What are the potential reactions that you imagine from foreign community, from the, U, from the US or European community where the Chinese students are going to. Are the Chinese coming in with the money? Do they need financial aid? No. Most of them do not, no. right? Are the Chinese coming in with poorer math, or poorer GRE, or poorer SAT scores? No. Well, so therefore, what do you think? This may potentially be an even bigger issue Right, between the Chinese uh, student community and the U.S. universities because both sides are claiming that the other side is not doing it fairly, right? Because the American universities say, oh, it's unfair to have our, also have our campus to have so many Chinese. We do not want to have this kind of ethnic concentration. Where well, Chinese community may claim that the, U.S. the US universities are not playing by the same standard. So this is another area of potential conflicts. This picture, what are they doing here? Any guess? What are they doing here? On the left, in the, in the first picture, what is this Chinese doing? Very good, I heard Wall Street. That's the key word. This Chinese young person is doing trading on the Wall Street floor, right? He's, doing a, he's a broker or he's a trader in, the, in a one Wall Street firm making money. Right, the Wall Street tip, you know, Wall Street businesses is, among many other businesses, is one of the most highly desired, right, desired position for students to, to go to. And the other picture, you own this guy. His name, Jack Maher. He went to the Wall Street, raised the largest amount of money in IPO, 
in the IPO of his company, right? Well, what are the potential reactions? What are the reactions to the first Chinese young guy, young Chinese guy working in the Wall Street? Job competition. What is the situation in the, when, when you go to apply for jobs? The Wall Street is already facing pressure because in the Wall Street they have Indians, they have Chinese, they have immigrants. Is the U.S. society very happy with the Wall Street? Can somebody tell me what's the situation nowadays in the Wall Street or in the U.S.? Anybody can tell me? Tell me? What's the popular views among American students and American people towards the Wall Street? Consumers are happy because they see Chinese goods being much cheaper, much less expensive than goods made in their local countries. However, producers and the competitors in these countries are feeling the other way around. Yet, this is another area in which the continued growth of China will create upon the rest of the world, right? That's the friction in the, for the rest of the world, right? Now, overall, overall, let's think about it. Overall, in all these countries, the tensions are already there. There are tensions between shop owners and consumers. There are tensions between there are tension between universities and applicants. There are tensions between Wall Street and the Main Street. But China is a catalyst in all these cases, amplifying all these tensions. So China it may not be the cause of all these tensions, but China certainly amplifies all these tensions in the rest of the world. Most likely, in countries which are relatively competitive and flexible in global competition, they will find it easier to deal with ever-rising China. In countries, the domestic social tension is already very high, and the government is barely hanging on to solve the social issues, the, emer the continued emergence of China will create even bigger trouble. That's the impact of the Chinese emergence upon the rest of the world. China is an accelerator of social tensions in many countries. That's the key point. So in the future, when we see foreign countries or foreign communities going against Chinese tourists. Instead of thinking this as an international issue, a racial, even racial issue, think about it as a natural social issue, domestic issue, caused by globalization. China becomes a proxy of globalization. China becomes an enemy, right? A proxy of enemy of, of globalization that people are trying to target. Okay. Second area is that when China becomes bigger and bigger, there will still be tensions between China and the rest of the world. China tends to claim that we are special. We, are, we have a special tradition. We have a long history. So Chinese affairs should be only resolved by Chinese own institutions and policies. Foreign mothers, foreign Inter intervention should not come to China. Look at this picture. In this picture, Deng Xiaoping and his wife were visiting the U.S. Cup first couple, President Jimmy Carter and his wife. What is the topic of the discussion? Jimmy Carter, being a devout Christian, was complaining to Deng Xiaoping that your po population policy is immoral. You are restricting the population growth in China. You are, you are taking away the freedom of Chinese couples in freeing, chewing the number of kids that they are willing to have. What was Deng Xiaoping's reply? Deng Xiaoping, as I said, a short guy. His reply was also equally short. He said, well, I would be more than happy to do away my one child family per family policy. 
But in exchange, are you ready, the U.S., to take 10 million immigration a year from China? That's the deal. Shall we do the deal? That's Deng Xiaoping's reply. What does it tell us? That was 40 years ago. What does it tell us? China is a country with large population and relatively very few arable land. The U.S., at least 150 years ago, was a large country with relatively small population. So both countries have different situation. The underlying logic of Deng Xiaoping is we are different from the U.S. Don't bother with our policies. It's like you are doing your homework and your classmates are doing your homework. You're working on your physics. Your classmate is working on economics. And the, the economist classmate is trying to give you advice on how to solve your physics problem using the economic logic. What would you say? Don't bother me. This is physics. This is not economics. The same logic here. Well, when China becomes bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger, will this logic be more assertive or not? Will this issue become more intense, more aggravated than today or not? What do you think? What is your opinion? What would Deng Xiaoping say? Imagine, imagine if the same issue were, were discussed again between Deng Xiaoping and Cut, Jimmy Carter. Imagine Jimmy Carter and Deng Xiaoping can re, relieve the same scenario. What would be the, how would the conversation go in today's context? In today's context, on this very issue of population. Well, today, the difference between today and 40 years ago is that China has demonstrated to the world that China has been a good student. Like a good student, doing homework well. The Chinese guy may say, don't tell me how to do my homework. I did my homework better than you do. You got a C, I got an A. How can you a C student tell A student what A student should do? Right? So I would say that Deng Xiaoping, if he were alive today, if he were con confronted with similar issues, he would be more assertive. What do you think? Right? More assertive is like a student doing well in exams, becoming more self-confident. And this is potentially a source of future conflict between China and the rest of the world. Here is a picture of who? You know him, Xi Jinping, the incumbent president of China. He was a vice president of China at that time, showing in the picture. Where were he? He was in Mexico. He was making a speech towards uh, an audience of overseas Chinese, ethnic Chinese, living in Mexico. What was his point? He was complaining about foreign countries. He said, we the Chinese, we are not exporting revolution. We are not like the former Soviet Union, trying to undermine foreign governments. We are not doing that. We are not creating poverty and refugees to the, for the rest of the world. We are not exporting refugees. Right? We are taking care of our poor people. Meanwhile, we are not trying to interfere in other countries' affairs. We're not trying to create trouble for foreign governments. But why you foreigners, especially Westerners, are complaining about China? We are good citizens of the world. Leave us alone. I'm translating what he said in this speech. Well, that's the mentality of Chinese leaders today. And this mentality may even be becoming more assertive, even stronger 
down the road when China, if China can deal with its own issues properly. Well, what kind of conflicts there will be for the future of the world? Imagine, imagine there are international, the International Forum on Population Policy on international politics being held. What would be the potential conflicts between China and the rest of the world? Will there be Western politicians becoming supportive of China or criticizing China? What is the impact of the continued rise of, of China upon foreign opinions on China? I need your view. Will foreign politicians, foreign commentators be more accommodating, willing to recognize Chinese policies or not? We have a saying in China that is people often look at foreign countries as mirrors. The mirror to reflect its own image. So in China, Chinese politicians and academics look at the U.S. or Europe trying to reflect what's going on in China, what China should do. Vice versa. Down the road, if China, it's big if, if China continues to rise, that's big if, then more, more and more likely, foreign politicians would look at China try as reflection of their domestic policy. So certain people, for example, in the U.S., would approve of certain practice of domestic policy of China and try to use China to convince their friends, their peers in the U.S. to adopt some Chinese-style policies. Others who belong to different political camp look at China and use Chinese weakness to argue in front of their peers to say, don't do that policy. And therefore, the second camp would be very critical, even more critical than on China than today. Think of this. When China becoming bigger and bigger, it will be looked more and more carefully. So again, China will become a splitter, a splitter of ideology in foreign countries. Some people in the US and Europe will be very, even more critical of, today, of China in the future than today. And others may become relatively accommodating and friendly. That is also the impact of China upon foreign countries. So Chinese affairs, domestic affairs, will become foreign affairs. Foreign politicians look at Chinese affairs with a lens of their own. That's the second impact. Next, let's look at the global impact. This picture, what this Chinese official doing? He is, many of you recognize, he is the current Minister of Foreign Affairs. He's voting in the UN. What is voting for? Well, he's voting, he's voting again, he's, he's casting a no vote on the UN resolution on the Syrian issue, going against the US and other Western countries, which is not very common. China entered, re-entered the UN, the mainland China went to the UN about 50 years ago. For the most part of the 50 years, China always voted abstain. So China's earned a name of Mr. Abstain. Always vote abstain. Well, in this case, in the Syrian case, China voted no against the US and the other Western countries. In this picture, this is the Chinese ambassador to the UN, again, casting a vote. The vote is on the Ukraine issue, the UN resolution. China voted abstain, very common. So this is not a happy outcome for the US and the foreign countries. Overall, the Chinese outlook on international issues is no intervention, no intervention. The Chinese belief is that the world affairs is too complicated. China is not willing to participate in resolving these issues. As we discussed in the last section, in the Chinese worldview, China would rather keep the current international order and focus on economic issues, on political conflicts. China tends to be very conservative. Well, this is today. Imagine, 
China is becoming even more capable. What is the reaction in foreign countries by Chinese conservative stance? What do you think? Metaphor might be help, might be the of help. Imagine sitting in the front row, we have a student who is extremely good. He earns A plus in all courses. Our friend Kevin. Kevin, you earned A plus in all your courses. And here we have an issue of what kind of curriculum our students should go through. And now people are look look upon you to say, Kevin, you are an A plus student. You should guide us. And you said, No, no, no. I don't want to make any opinion. I will follow the consensus. What do you think of Kevin? Now imagine, instead of doing well in class, he's also doing well in business. He's a billionaire. Kevin, you're a billionaire by virtue of your excellence in academics. You're a billionaire, and now we have certain problems. Certain of our classmates temporarily is in financial trouble, and they come to you to say, "Oh, please, Kevin, can you help?" And Kevin says, "No, let me think about it." So that possibly may be the dilemma China faces in the world: that it, when China becoming stronger and stronger, bigger, bigger economy with more capacity. Or perceived capacity to interfere in world affairs, but China stays behind. That would create bigger and bigger right, tensions between China and the rest of the world. That is the third global. That is the tension. Okay, just now I explained to you that when China becoming bigger and bigger, there will be. More tensions between China and the rest of rest of the world. Final words to wrap up our discussion so far. First, we would like to say that most likely the Chinese economy will face bigger and bigger challenge down the road because the economy is becoming more and more complex and the society is becoming more and more multi-dimensional. However, there are a few factors which are Pushing, most likely pushing the Chinese economy to continue to grow. Here in the chart, I showed the red chart, in which I believe that that's the most likely path of the future growth of China. The most likely path is the path of East Asia. That is, by 2050, most likely China's per capita income will be close to 70 percent of the U.S., which is a big number, which is like today's. Per capita income of Taiwan and Japan. So, by implication, by 2050, if all these fundamental factors play out for the Chinese economy, the big, the total size of the Chinese economy may be three times as big as the U.S. economy. However, the path of the Chinese continued. Economic growth will not be even. Most likely, to the contrary, most likely will be volatile, just like this. This is the chart of China's GDP growth of the past 35 years. Look at the volatility of the GDP growth rates. In 1990, the GDP growth rate came down to only four percent, whereas in in 1985. The GDP growth rate shoot up to 15 percent. The future of China's economic emergence might be even more volatile than this. Even though, as I said, the overall path of growth can be expected. That's the first point I would like to wrap up. Second thing I would like to explain to you is that most likely the Chinese economy. Will not repeat what happened in the U.S. or Japan during their economic emergence. During the Japanese and the U.S. economic emergence, the GDP growth was really, really volatile, having many, many years of negative growth. That is recession. Why? Because in today's Chinese society and also in today's global economy, policymakers have much more instruments. For them to rely upon monetary policy, physical policy, 
policies regarding uh, export, we, we call trade policy, or even policy regarding wages, we call income policy. So more and more policies are, at the, in, are available for policymakers to smooth the economy. So the extreme volatility might be avoided. The third thing I would like to emphasize as wrap up is that with the continued emergence of China, the relationship between China and the rest of the world will be more and more complicated. Conflicts, major conflicts might be avoided because as we explained to you before, I discussed before, the Chinese policymakers are not looking to overturn the world. Rather, they are focusing on a homebound policies, home-oriented policies. However, even though major conflicts between China and the rest of the world in the fashion of World War I might be or most likely be avoided, minor conflicts most likely will emerge. Look at these pictures. These pictures are the protests of Chinese students in front of the U.S. Embassy. For what? For the U.S. missile hitting the Chinese Embassy in Yugoslavia in the 1990s. These kind of conflicts between China and the rest of the world most likely will happen from time to time. Let's be ready. However, again, let me emphasize, huge or major conflicts in the style of World War I or World War II between China and the U.S. or the rest of the world most likely will be avoided. Finally, as final words, as this picture shows, when China becoming bigger and bigger, the Chinese views and the policies will be carefully, carefully studied and attention will be paid towards the Chinese policies and the Chinese perspectives. Just as the picture shows, President Obama is shaking hand, bending forward with President then Hu Jintao. That is one picture, perhaps, of the future of China and the world. Thank you. Thank you.